extraordinarily glad and grateful that they all agreed to put themselves. They have no idea what we're going to talk about tonight, so yeah. They have put themselves at my mercy, um, and we are very grateful, and hopefully it will pay off well. Um, so we have um, Professor Tony Dorfman and Professor John Gaddis. Um, Professor Dorfman is the DUS of Theater Studies here at Yale. She's one of the founders of the Yale Playwright Festival. Um, and they have been married for 11 years since 1997. 15. 15. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> math, math was never my strong point. Um, okay. Um, uh, Professor, um, Professor Don Gaddis teaches in the history department. He focuses on the Cold War and he's director of the Grand Strategy program here at Yale. Um, Professor Marvin Chun um, <laughs> and Professor, and professor um, Wu Kyung An are master and associate master of Berkeley College. They both are psychology professors. They both sort of focus on cognitive science um, and they have been married since 1996. Um, and then we have Professor um, Professor Dean Levin and President Rick Levin. Um, Professor Levin teaches literature here at Yale. She's DUS of the Directed Studies Program, <laughs> of which I am a proud graduate. Though I never, I never had Professor Levin as my as um, as my teacher. Um, and President Rick Levin has been president of Yale University since 1993. He taught economics here before um, becoming president. And in the summer, he will be um, retiring after 20 years of, of wonderful service. So thank you to both of you. I felt I wanted to marry her. <laughs> <laughs> 
But, but it took a lot longer to get her say yes. <laughs> On our third date. After two weeks. <laughs> oh, what? Third date, fourth date, second date. <laughs> but I knew within the first 25 minutes, I was sitting down at dinner on that first date. Uh, while we were exchanging emails. 
Um, and then uh, the relationship started to get more serious. Um, I was a postdoc in Boston, and she was an assistant professor uh, in Kentucky. And, um, um, and at the time, I, was, uh, I had a job offer from South Korea, which is a bit far from, uh, from Kentucky. Uh, so, so, um, although I never really formally proposed early on in the relationship, I had, to, I had a deadline uh, by which I had to uh, accept the offer from Korea. Um, and so basically accepting that offer, with, or not accepting the offer, at least in my mind, meant that I really had to marry her. Um, <laughs> um, or at least if I accepted the offer, it was very clear that she was not interested in following some strange guy to some <laughs> far away place, uh, because I'm not as distinguished as John. <laughs> um, or was it? <laughs> so, I don't think ever. Um, but, um, uh, so uh, I think, uh, and yeah, there, it was actually a pretty complicated situation uh, because uh, the school by, uh, that had offered me a job was also a school that she had graduated from, uh, and, and so there were some extra complications there. But long story short, um, I felt in my mind that I was fully committed to this, uh, pursuing this relationship when I turned down my job from Korea. So it's not that romantic. I <laughs> certainly so didn't did have you, any margaritas. Wait, but. Did you turn down the job? <laughs> You turned down the job before knowing for sure that she was going to say yes? Oh, I mean, I, yeah, I, I mean, actually, I, <laughs> actually, you know, I, I got, she uh, turned me down so a couple times in our relationship, so I lose track. All right, uh, okay, let's, let's take the uh, on. Um, so it might have been during those, one of those moments when she had already, like, said, okay, you know, I'm not going out with someone who has this fancy job in South Korea because no one has ever turned down a job in South Korea before that because it's a very, it was a very comfortable, nice job. Um, and um, so I think even after I turned it down, I wasn't trying to do it to impress her or anything. It was just part of my own uh, commitment uh -huh. of what I felt was more important. Wait, pr Professor On, do you remember how many times you said no before you said yes? Uh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know how many times, but uh, so he, I still remember he called me from Boston and said, okay, tomorrow's the deadline, whether I should accept the, the, the offer or not. Um, and I said, no, I cannot commit um, uh -huh. at this point, because we've been over emails only for like three months at that point. <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> when met when, once, when you think. say over email, you hadn't met in person. Um, it's complicated. And we how did you do that? <laughs> did, someone, did someone introduce you, or who sent the like, I, I introduced myself. <laughs>
kind of like Peter Salome, exactly. so yeah. uh, was, yeah. was involved was in the yeah. uh, <laughs> Wait, so then, um, before I let you guys off the hook, Professor Ahn, what made you finally um, say yes? Ooh, never heard uh, of this. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was, um, there was no really official proposal or anything like that, but it just kind of folded over. It was like, it was just like, he felt, um, as we were like dating and, you know, traveling, it felt like he was just like part of my family. Yeah, it was just natural. Yeah. <laughs> right. Bye. Um, <laughs> um, so, who proposed and um, how did that happen? Uh, there, it was the 60s. There, there wasn't a proposal. <laughs> it would have seemed, you know, um, I mean, actually I'm amazed that you kids pro that, you know, propose, that one proposes to the other. I mean, they could be mutual agreement. But that's pretty much, we just grew into it. We've spent all of our free time together in junior and senior year. And I, I mean, it's, again, it would be hard for you to believe this generation gap, but, but uh, because it, the, the, this, this way of doing things ended within two years of our graduation. But, the, but uh, half of our friends got married within a year of college, within a year of graduate. I mean, I'm literally 50%. I, I lived in a house with three other guys, and all of us got married within, within a year. So um, this was, I don't know, just what point we just, we just sort of, it just seemed obvious. Certainly by the beginning of senior year, we just knew, okay, we're gonna get married. And I don't think we sort of told anybody till Christmas time of, um, of a sort of Christmas vacation of senior year. Yeah, it's completely true. First of all, yeah, basically you went to, well, if you grew up in my family, and I have two other sisters, and my father had two maiden sisters, so maiden aunts. I mean, I went to college to get married, and thank God. <laughs> I mean, thank, thank God at that time, Stanford had, um, you know, one-third women and two-thirds men. So that was, I mean, in my day, we looked on that as a real advantage. Um, and, and, um, so, yeah, it's sort of, um, as Rick said, he made up his mind, um, spring of sophomore year, but I was still carrying the torch for this guy gone out with freshman year who graduated at the end of my freshman year, was a, a national, is a Stanford varsity athlete, nationally ranked runner, you know, Olympic trial. <laughs> Yeah. Well, let's we, we put it this way. 
you knew they'd be, they'd be ecstatic. They were over the moon. I mean, my father was ecstatic. I mean, the first of like three daughters, I mean, thank God. <laughs> I mean, they just thought he was just like, you know, the sun and the moon. So, yeah, they were ecstatic. <laughs> um, um, so, after hearing so much, I guess, about um, finally getting to that place of love, I'm kind of curious how um, it's been sustained through, through so many years of marriage. Um, so let's pull up the white, I mean, we're gonna go back to the whiteboards. Um, and what was your first big fight? And what was it about once you were married? many 
obligations and sort of public time commitments. Um, what sort of compromise, how did that impact your relationship and what are you looking forward um, to as a couple after this summer? Well, yeah. Um, <laughs> President, you know, it was this enormous change in our life because, um, you know, I was teaching part time. We have four children. I mean, now they're of course grown; they're adults. Um, our youngest child was eight years old. Three of our kids were still at home, and all of a sudden, we were just like going out to these. I mean, and also, you know, we don't live at 43 Hill House. We decided to live in our stay in our own house. Um, we didn't want the kids, as um, our beloved friend Marie Rosa Menacal um, used to say, to develop um, the lost Samovar syndrome. That, <laughs> oh, those were the glory days when we lived in a 28 room house with our own Renoirs. So, um, so we just stayed in our own house where we live on a street with half the economics department, and, um, you know, which was Rick's department. And, um, but this meant, of course, that we were always going out a lot. And so that was like, you know, that was, um, that was disruptive. Although we had this, um, our next door neighbor, um, would, who's, um, the sons unfortunately went to Harvard where they played hockey in a very distinguished way. Um, <laughs> so, um, um, you know, um, she just became like a second mother, especially to our youngest, um, to our youngest daughter. So, um, so that, that worked out. So that was like, but you know, the thing is, I mean, net, net, it's been, I mean, it's been amazing. I mean, it's truly been amazing. I, I mean, it's just been absolutely amazing. It's amazing <laughs> to have been given this chance to like, to serve Yale and have this privilege and help Yale flourish and meet all these amazing and remarkable people. I mean, faculty, students, alumni, people that, that we meet in the course of it. So, I mean, so leaving it, it's like a very, it's a very bittersweet, um, it's a very bittersweet experience, even though I think it's the right thing. But I'll tell you, one thing that, um, that really took it up a notch was, you know, we're sort of thinking, oh, maybe we should like be away next fall. You know, we talked to Susan Hockfield, who stepped down as president of MIT, and Dick Gerhard Casper, who stepped down as president of Stanford. And um, we were sort of debating that, and we were kind of thinking about it. And right before we went to Davos, to the World Economic Forum, I said, you know, in the end of January, I said, you know, we really need to come to some decision, because I need to say, tell the humanities program if I'm going to teach in DS next, next fall. And so we looked on the Stanford website, and this really was like an act of God. There was one house for rent, and it was literally one block from our oldest son's house and his wife and their three kids. So I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so, so in the fall, you will both only be at Stanford? Stanford. Yeah. No, only Rick will be visiting there. Well, you'll, you'll I'm not going to be teaching. You'll be, yeah, we'll, be, yeah. we'll both be living there. We'll be living there. Right. Yeah, we'll both be living there. <laughs> okay. But I'll be playing with my grandchildren. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, President Levin, what like, difficulties and what are you looking forward to? Well, I would only add that the, the decision to stay in our um, home on Everett Street rather than the 43 house was really, in terms of family and personal life, was a hugely good decision. Because it just, it just got us out of the fishbowl of being in a, a sort of quasi-public, I mean, the presence has a public space. It's really not cozy. And, and uh, while well, we love it, you know, it's a great place to entertain. It, 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 we just have, to, we, we do have, you know, on the two nights a week, we're not doing Yale things. We, we can, we, we get to have dinner at home in our, in our comfortable and cozy house. And I think that makes, um, that's made a lot of difference for sort of just keeping a sense of perspective and a sense of, you know, you know the normal life goes on even in the presence. And so we're, we're looking forward, you know, we're going to go spend the fall in uh, Palo Alto and and I'm, I'm sure I'll, I'll have a lot more time to spare. I, I'm not going to, I'm going to find something else to do after this, but it, whether it's a big, one big job or a portfolio of smaller ones, uh, you know, it'll, I'll take my time to figure that out. And meanwhile, you know, we'll have a lot of, a lot of fun time with our, each other, with each other, and with uh, our seven grandchildren on the entire West Coast. So we'll, um, that'll be lots of fun. Do you, so all of your children live on the West Coast? Yeah. So are they excited that you guys will be out there? Yeah, they, I mean, it's really nice. They really recruited us to come out there. Yeah. They, they, they were not, they were, um, I mean, if they had been the least bit ambivalent, I think we would have been ambivalent. So they, were, they, were, they were really enthusiastic. Once, uh, I mean, speaking of your children, can you just, how did your, it seems that having, like, more so than getting married, having children is what really changes um, a couple's relationship to each other. Can you talk about um, how, how your relationship changed 
changed after you had children, started having children? Um, I mean, I would say it, it, it really became, uh, I mean, it really becomes a central focus of your, of your family time. I mean, it just, particularly little kids, are just incredibly, uh, incredibly demanding of um, attention. And, it did their, and they're a great joy. And, you know, Jay basically gave up for professional work and stayed home for 15 years. I'll let you talk about that, but you should. Yeah, but that would, it wouldn't be right to say that I gave up on it because, like, you know, the thing is, I mean, when John was, like, our oldest son was born in 1972, you know, it was just like, I mean, I couldn't believe it. It was just like so utterly, utterly amazing. So it took me two more years to finish up my dissertation, and then right after it was right after I finished it, our second, our second son, um, Daniel, was born. And um, and I stayed home for the next 15 years with our kids. We have four kids, and it was, I mean, it was heaven. Truthfully, I loved it. I mean, that's just like, I mean. Yeah, it was just it was it was fantastic. And then in 1990, when um, when John went to Stanford, and, and our youngest um, our youngest child, our daughter, our youngest daughter, um, went to kindergarten. That was it. You know, I was out of a job as a full time mother because by that time, kindergarten was like this all day event. It was like from 8:30 in the morning to like three in the afternoon. I mean, when John went to kindergarten, it was like two hours a day. And um, and you know, so um, luckily for me, I mean, Dick Broadhead, who's now of course president of Duke University, but was then chairman of the Yale English Department. So I went to talk to him, and um, lucky for me, I mean, the English Department has had at that point about 10 non-ladder faculty um, that taught freshmen the English. And so that's I started teaching um, teaching in the English department. Um, you know, but just part part time I only taught one course each semester, you know, so that I could like, you know, be there to pick and pick the kids up and, you know, be there with, and go to all their games and, you know, and like be there to bake cookies with them and do all that stuff. Um, so yeah, until Becca went to, um, went to college, um, went to Stanford in 2003, I just, I worked part time. And then when she went to college, then I started teaching, you know, teaching full time. And I started, well, I started teaching in DS in 1993 or 1994. But I only, you know, I was just teaching, just teaching part time. Um, yeah, so like, yeah, so, um, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so this is for Professor Gaddis and Professor Dorfman. Um, you guys have this incredibly romantic story. You met within two weeks. You were engaged. Um, and so 15, almost 16 years later, uh, <laughs> as I now know, what, um, how do you, um, do you feel like that, that romance is still there? How do you sustain sort of the spark of romantic love within married life? I... I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's the great question. It's a great question. <laughs> and I know I sound kind of soppy. Uh, you know, this is it's John, Valentine's Day. John and soppy. my second marriage, and uh, we were each married to other people who we loved for 31 years, who uh, they uh, dumped us uh, simultaneously uh, before we started dating. And um, all I know is I felt so lucky to fall in love with this creature here. <laughs> and it's funny, um, what happens is I get up in the morning and I go, I make coffee and I put out all our vitamin pills and I take the alarm off so when I go out to get the paper, a huge noise doesn't start. And I sit there and I read the paper and it takes me an hour and a half to drink my coffee, which is why I get up so early. It just takes a while to become a human being. And then I hear these, John is barefoot, coming down the steps, these very whispery footsteps. Pat, pat, pat. And my heart starts beating like this every morning. <laughs> And 
I have two sons. Tony has a, a daughter as well. So they were grown up by the time this, this happened. And we're rather shocked by it. And um, my son said something like, Dad, isn't this very sudden, this uh, sudden proposal? You know, they were quite surprised by this. But the question of children and the question of children as a bond in marriage is something that's very important. But when we came here, uh, you know, we had a somewhat different situation. We actually had an offer from Dick Broadhead while he was dean of York College to become the master of a college. Um, and I think there were maybe two offers uh, while Dick was uh, dean. We thought about this. And we thought about the absence of children in the house. And we thought about moving in with, how many is it, 400 <laughs> children? <you know? laughs> we finally decided, um, no, this was more children than we would want to take on. <laughs> So part of the compromise is that the house is, uh, as some of you know who've been there, just off campus, and it's an easy walk over there. So um, we regularly have our classes, our seminars uh, over. I see Danny out there, and Yuval is out there somewhere, and they've all been over to that, to that house. But we have the advantage of being able to have small numbers of children, uh, I mean students, uh, <laughs> grown up children, uh, over to our house. But then to be able to shove them out the front door. <laughs> and at our age, that's a luxury. At this time, I want to turn it over to Master Chun. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess I want to I wanna hear um, how, how children uh, change your relationship to one another. And also, um, you're sort of the only couple up here who really works in the same academic field. So I'm very curious, uh, is that, does that ever feel like too close? You, your worlds are so intertwined, um, and what was that like? Um, so I think children uh, bring out the best in a relationship. Um, everything that I really admired and loved about uh, Ugyang, uh when I wanted to marry her, I think the motherhood uh, and being a fellow parent kind of brings out all those best features. Um, you know, she's, as, as anyone who's taken her class, uh, she's one of the most well-organized people in the world, and, and I think parenthood take, requires a lot of organization. Um, it, it also confirmed that uh, the values that you have, because there are so many decisions you have to make in raising a kid, and it just, you know, just we never had any uh, disagreements about what we thought was important and good for our kids, uh, and just to not even have to discuss that, just to be able to take that almost for granted is a huge uh, blessing. So I, th I think uh, parenthood, um, is really has been wonderful for us as a couple. Um, also, just you know, in terms of what's great about marriage, you know, in, in my case, I consider her my better half. She makes me a much better person than I was before I met her. Uh, and the great thing about kids is that you know you see your best features in the kids, um, and uh, and sometimes your worst features too. But, uh, <laughs> but overall, our, our bigger, you see, I see my wife's best features in my kids. I see my some of my few. One, the, one, the one feature I like about myself, I see <laughs> um, my handsome good looks. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, 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 so just, you know, parenthood has been truly a big blessing uh, in, in, our, in our marriage and our relationship. Uh, with regards to the academic stuff, I think, you, 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 you want to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, so that's kind of a, a simple related to the children issue, but just finish up. Uh, so one of the reasons that I um, turned down his sort of marriage proposal was that he eats too slowly. <laughs> so slow that uh, we calculated it. If I have to spend, uh, uh, so for each one month of marriage, no, 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 how did it go? Well, I calculated it for her. <laughs> um, so the out of all the time she has to wait for me to finish eating, um, over 10 years of mar marriage, it'd be three months, uh, 24 hours a day. But no, but but, but, but because after we did that calculation, uh, she, I and asked, the don't wait for me. Yeah. <laughs> and then the child was born, and he started eating faster. Yeah. So that was a good change. Um, one thing that um, that's uh, uh, important in marriage is to have a common goal of 
or common enemies. <laughs> and uh, at the, um, when we were dating, the common goal was to get a job in the same place, uh, especially when we are in the same field, which is very uh, challenging. So that really helped us to bond. Um, he flew from Boston three times to um, make me uh, practice my job talk. Um, and that was, he, I still remember that was the most romantic uh, moment of my He basically choreographed the entire talk. He said, over there, point over this, and then you know, pause there, and make an eye contact. And it was just unbelievable. That was the best talk I've ever given in my lifetime. Um, <laughs> And then after we got married, um, the next goal was to get a grant, and um, so we also, so as we were um, having uh, a lear learning about each other, we learned a lot about which button not to press, right? So, um, and one of the things we said was never go for the same grant uh, deadline at the same time, okay? Because there's no way the family can function <laughs> when two people are working on the uh, grant. So, um, but it must, yeah. it must have been nice that you guys could understand that exactly. pressure. Yeah. Yes. That's right. yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. So it's that kind of thing. So that's really good. Uh, but we cannot collaborate at all. I mean, um, uh, <laughs> we can't even cook together in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> or, or eat at the same pace. <laughs> um, so then during, so the same during the day, um, like during the normal work day, how often do you guys have lunch together? Do you see each other? Or do you sort of go to work and then come back at night? Uh, yeah, I mean, so because uh, you know, we, we, we lived together and uh, we do so many things together. Uh, we, I think one thing that also works really well in our professional relationship is that we don't overlap very much, although we are in the same department um, and uh, we are actually even in the same area of psychology. We're about as far apart as you can get within our area and we don't collaborate. Uh, and um, I think that helps because it helps us make, I think an important thing in any relationship is that you maintain your own identity. Um, I think a good relationship is not about just totally giving up yourself uh, to anyone. I think that you maintain who you are and you enhance who you are uh, through a relationship and enhance the other, hopefully. Um, and so I think, and I think in our case that happens in our professional academics is that we don't um, um, work together on our, our research uh, because I, I think that's kind of where, our, that's our private space and that's our, that's our self space. Uh, so we, we, it's, it's been fairly uh, distinct uh, up to now. That, this is not to say some, some faculty definitely do collaborate, um, uh, and, and I think that works for them, but in our case, uh, we collaborate on everything outside of work, uh, but, but not on work itself. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, I mean, all of you are just you know, obviously incredibly dedicated to your academic work, um, incredibly dedicated to your students and your other commitments. A lot of, a lot of students um, at Yale feel sort of overscheduled, overwhelmed, and you'll sometimes hear the sentiment of like, I'm too busy for a relationship. Does anyone have any advice for, for any of these students? <laughs> There are 36 minutes in every day when she's finished eating and he's done and he's still at it. So there's 36 minutes you could be talking to her every day. That would be a good thing to do. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, I think um, you know. I, I think there's no such thing as being too busy to have a, a good relationship with somebody. Um, the, it's really one of the most important things you can do in life, and life is too hard and too lonely to try to go at it on your own. Uh, it's way more fun, it's way more, meaning, more meaningful and fulfilling uh, to go through life together with someone with whom you feel very compatible and very com comfortable. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm not proposing I'll run off to toads right now or anything. <laughs> You know, spend, working on relationships do, doesn't mean like going on singles websites or or going to toads or going to you know well, I'm not going to name a fraternity, <laughs> um, but um, it, it's about just hanging out with people and getting and meeting new people uh, and um, and you do that in the dining hall naturally here at Yale and you do that in your clubs and you do that in your activities and you do that in your classrooms and and in preparing for your classes so. Um, all that, uh, in my mind, is, is working on relationships, and if, 
you know, if the right person comes along, then you'll know it. It just, as you can see here, it just comes together. Um, and, and so I, I think all that time is very well uh, worthwhile putting time into. There's nothing more important. You can be the most successful, rich person in the world, but if you don't, if you don't have a happy uh, you know, relationship, I, I think something's missing. I think one aspect of that that's very important is the business of opposites. Uh, Tony and I are very unlike each other. In fact, so much so that we're, uh, we think we're very fortunate that we fell in love when old because we would have hated each other when young. Uh, I'm an old lefty. She is an old lefty in this, you know. <laughs> so, I, I, this was unexpected. <laughs> um, but uh, it's more than that. Uh, our temperaments are completely different. I am shy, reserved, buttoned up, all of this, you know, uh, uh, not demonstrative, all of these things. Tony is just the opposite of this. It comes from being in the theater, it comes from being who she is. But this thing about quietly padding downstairs barefoot in the morning to read the morning paper, um, this is always an adventure because I will be sitting there quietly reading the morning paper and then suddenly from uh, Tony's end of the table there will come very loudly an obscenity. <laughs> <laughs> One word, four letters. I will explain what it is. It will be there. But with no context, whatever, you know, just there. <laughs> or uh, we have adjoining offices in the house, and uh, you know, we'll be working sometimes late at night, and the same thing will happen. Uh, and I have to go running in to see what disaster has occurred, but it's just an emotional uh, reaction. So it's a complete difference in the time, uh, between the uh, and uh, Tony is just much more in touch with her um, feelings than I am. <laughs> okay, we can, uh, we'll take off. Um, so we'll have two questions. We're going to have to start wrapping up. But um, so you talk about having very different temperaments. You talk about sort of um, though your heart's still beating when Professor Gaddis walks down the stairs. But in what ways has your relationship changed um, throughout the, the course of your marriage? Have you guys? Grown, grown more similar, um, figured out your differences in other ways? Well, I think my uh, political stance has become a little more nuanced, put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, I've become a little more theatrical. <laughs> so, Go for Obama. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if it weren't, why are you shocked? <laughs> if it weren't for Tony, um, I'd be very uncomfortable in this room where I lecture uh, with not as much arm waving as the present new provost does when he does any theory on this stage, but nonetheless, much more arm waving than I would have done before meeting Tony. So you do change in surprising ways, and I think that's uh, part of what um, the rest of you were talking about. Uh, the very importance of having this kind of relationship because it makes up for what's missing in yourself. I think that's really the best way to understand it. And there's something missing in all of ourselves that requires uh, some balance, some compensation, and certainly that's what Tony does for me. My grandmother uh, was a um, immigrant with a fifth grade education from Kovna province near Vilna, mini Dorfman. And uh, I used to fall in love all the time as a kid. And my grandmother would say, oh, Fagala, you know, you can't live on love alone. Eventually you get a little weak in the knees. But she uh, called me up one day when I was 23 years old. I was in Iowa City and she was in Birmingham. And uh, she said, honey, are you in love? And I said, yeah, Graham, I'm in love. And she said, good, good. She said, love is the most important thing in the world. And we talked uh, thus and for a little while. I said, thanks for calling, Graham. And she died the next day. And I found out later that she called eight or nine people 
that day, and that was pretty much what she had to say. And sometimes I can read her. I can actually, by looking at how she looks at her computer screen, I can tell who she gets an email from. <laughs> Whether it's from someone she, you know, <laughs> well, I won't go into details. <laughs> and, and so, you know, and that process, and, and then because we have kids, the kids grow, and every year is different as kids uh, age. Uh, and just as I mentioned earlier, just life is a really fun process is very dynamic and to be able to go through that together with someone who uh, that you feel very that you really like being together with uh, and that makes you a better person uh, that that's just a real um, uh, a real treasure um, one thing that changed was I thought he was really funny when we were dating <laughs> but he is still funny to other people but I can read what he's thinking. So I can predict, so I know what he's about to say. <laughs> so it's, it's not funny to me anymore. <laughs> this is what my course evaluation say too. <laughs> readers. 
like guinea pigs and gerbils and all that kind of stuff. You know, they're much more short-lived. Um, and, and also, they didn't shred up the living room furniture. <laughs> but, um, yeah, but like, I mean, it's like, oh, well, if, if Rick were to be made an offer to be president of Yale, how would you think about it? I'm like, sure, fine, sounds good to me. I'm totally chill. I had no idea. <laughs>